Hello and welcome to Lingua Musica, where music is the universal language. I'm Joe Kendrick, very happy to be joined today on a Google Hangout on air via the magic of the interwebs. Over in Nashville, Tennessee, I'm talking with Rick Barker of Music Industry Blueprint. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Now tell me about your name, because doesn't lingua mean tongue? I was making this as a kind of play on lingua franca. Okay. So, so sort of like music being the universal language, lingua musica, that sort of thing. Very nice. Okay, I look at it. I remember one time somebody tried to get me to eat lingua, and I didn't know what it was, <laughs> and they explained to me it was cow tongue. So I'm like, man, you know, Joe's pretty creative here, you know. He's got the whole play on words going on. Yeah, maybe we've got a, a new graphic idea now. Absolutely. You know, tasting our way across the music industry, you know. <laughs> Licking one artist at a time. <laughs> <laughs> that one could probably get us in trouble, though. So we have it to could. be careful there. It could. Well, Rick, you're the owner of MusicIndustryBlueprint.com. Tell us a little bit about how you transitioned over from a career in radio to Big Machine Records and then your platform of Nashville to you. Okay. Uh, basically, I've always – radio has been my passion. You know, when I got sober back in, you know, 1989, I, it was weird because I was, I'd always loved radio. I grew up listening to radio. I was the guy that would subscribe to those services where I could get air checks of other great disc jockeys sent to me on cassette, and I would listen to them. So I really loved the concept of being on radio. I grew up poor, so I never had a chance to take instrument lessons or anything, but I'd always loved the music business and wanted to find my way in. My way came by way of radio. Uh, I started in Los Angeles working at KISS FM, uh, got my first on-air start in Santa Barbara and did my whole entire radio career in Santa Barbara County. In 2001, I got asked by a buddy of mine to launch a country radio station and uh, I had never been in the country format. I'd done classic rock, I'd done alternative rock, I'd done hip hop, sports talk. I mean, I'd done all the English speaking language stations, uh, but never country. Not to say that country people don't speak English, but the point I was trying to make was there was not a country station in the area. I was raised in Alabama, but got to California when I was 17, so I hadn't been around it, didn't understand the lifestyle. So we launched this radio station. I've always been a promoter. I've always helped bands. Um, I did two CDs back in Santa Barbara called Santa Barbara's Unsigned Heroes years ago. Dishwalla, Toad the Wet Sprocket. There was a really cool Santa Barbara music scene going on in the early 90s. So I'd always been around music. So I found a club. I had the radio station. And I'm like, wait a minute here. I'm going to try to put these two things together. We've got this beautiful part of the country. What would it take to start getting artists to come out here? So I called the folks and uh, Nashville and I said hey I've got this great club I've got this radio station we can promote it and they were like well it's real expensive for people to get out to California from Nashville and with most new artists it's hard to get them paid you know it's a it's a money loser not a money maker and I said well what if I can get five six seven eight radio stations that will put up money to be able to bring the artist out here and they're like there's no way radio doesn't put up money. I said, well, you guys are asking the wrong people. You're talking to the program directors. I'm going to go to the sales departments and create a promotion around it to where actually everybody makes money, including the radio station. So they're like, good luck with that. Let us know how that works out. Well, I did. I called radio stations in San Jose and LA and Bakersfield and all over the place and ended up putting together this cool little run. And we called it Nashville to you. You know, if you couldn't get to Nashville, we'd bring Nashville to you and I would take the artist at the bottom end of the charts who hadn't had any success yet and were just starting their careers and some of my first clients were Sugarland, Little Big Town, Rodney Atkins, Craig Morgan and I caught the eye of Scott Borchetta at the time he was at DreamWorks started bringing out some of Scott's artists then he went over to MCA and Mercury continued bringing out Scott's artists and then he contacted me in 2004 and said, hey, I'm getting ready to start my own label. Uh, by that time, Toby Keith and Scott had gone out and started two record labels. There was Show Dog, which Toby owned, Big Machine Records, which Scott owned, but they shared a staff. And when they decided that they were going to part ways, Scott called and offered me 
uh, a position to be a West Coast record promoter. He knew how much I made in radio. He knew he could pay me a lot more being a record promoter. And I told him, I said, I've, I've never been a record promoter. Why would you kind of hire me? You know, you've got this choice of anybody in town would love to work for you. And the comment that he made for me basically was, you've been promoting and helping me break new artists for the last two years. You just haven't been paid for it. He said, I'm going to start this label with Jack Ingram, Danielle Peck, who I had known uh, from when she was at DreamWorks. Jack I'd heard of, but had never heard music or anything. And this 15-year-old named Taylor Swift that definitely no one had heard of. He said, most folks will use that as a reason to why it won't work. He said, you just seem to kind of go in one direction. So I uh, took the job, flew out to Nashville, met with him, uh, heard the music, fell in love with the music. Uh, the label gets going. We're having a great success with Jack Ingram. And then I get a phone call saying, hey, uh, Taylor needs to learn radio. Let me send her out west to where you are. You love to teach. She wants to learn. You guys get together. And we were going to do a 30-day radio run just going up and down the state introducing her to folks, you know, weren't no no agenda not adding records just going to introduce her teacher about radio she flew out that 30 days changed both of our lives uh, she wanted to learn I wanted to teach we were doing things that were starting to create a buzz and a few months after that I got the call from her family asking if I would be interested in being her manager so that's how I ended up in the Taylor camp and the big machine camp and now it's you know, did that for a couple years. Are we having birds that are attacking right now? or <laughs> We have a new uh, bunch of chickens that just arrived. Awesome. Awesome. Dinner <laughs> at your house. <laughs> they're, they're little chicks. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah, it just sounded like you had quite the flock going on over there. Yeah, but, they uh, just arrived. Oh, well. <laughs> awesome. So... So basically, I was with Taylor for a couple of years. Uh, my last year with her was uh, 2008. Uh, I ended up doing 189 days on the, or yeah, about 189 days on the road that year. Had a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Would you know start in California, drive from Santa Barbara to LA, get on a plane, land in Nashville, get on a bus, do our tour, get back and go back and forth, and finally, I just. I realized that it was just it was not the right thing for me. You know, I, I wanted to raise my kids. I come from divorced parents. Uh, I never got into anything ever for the money because I didn't grow up with money. So that's never been a motivating factor for me. But the opportunities that presented themselves and the doors that were open and the relationships that were made, I thought that I needed to continue managing artists. So I start signing artists to this management company. And then after a couple years of realizing that even though I had artists signed to major labels, there was a lot that was out of my control. It was really starting to frustrate the artist. It was really starting to frustrate us. Uh, artists were starting to feel that it was a priority that they were in this business and not a privilege. I'm making money through my consulting business to finance this management company. And then right around 2011, I just kind of had the epiphany of, you know what, I'm working harder than the folks that I'm representing and there are probably a lot of people out there that would love to to talk with me and have the knowledge and experience that I had so I needed to kind of come up with a way where I could serve as many people as possible while still maintaining a, a level of integrity while still maintaining you know there's a lot of I don't want to call them scams because they're just somebody else's business model but there was a lot of people coming to Nashville purchasing things they weren't in a position to purchase, parents second mortgaging homes so that their kids could record with the same people that Taylor Swift and Carrie Underwood and everyone else records with or get videos done. And that model wasn't working. It wasn't working for the majors. What was going to make it work for the independents? Everybody felt that they could buy their way in to this, you know, buy some success. And I always say you can buy your way into the business, but you can't buy success. If it could be purchased, I would be selling it. I'd be on the outskirts of town with a hedge fund business going, come on in, I got a record deal for you. This is how much it costs. So as I started seeing a lot of that going on, I started just asking questions of people saying, you know, what can we do to prevent this? What can we do to teach? I started seeing how much money these colleges were making, charging people for music degrees, for jobs oh, yeah. that weren't available, and talking to a lot of those students, finding out there was a lot of theory that was being taught 
but not a lot of practical uh, applications to the things that they were being taught. So I went out to change all that and uh, have been blessed to have uh, been able to to do quite well with musicindustryblueprint.com. Uh, I used it as a portal where people could go and get free information. Uh, I now offer a video series that runs over four days where I teach people as much as I possibly can about the music business. And then I create an opportunity for them if they would like to have my team as a part of their team. We do it in a way that makes it super affordable because we're not physically spending every hour of our day working for those folks. Most people just need a security blanket, someone they can pick up and get on the phone and say, hey, this opportunity has been presented. What do you think about it? And then get advice from someone who's actually in the business. So that's kind of what I've created, you know, is this portal and this group of people where I refer to us as their insurance policy in the music business. You know, you have access to us when you need us. Hopefully you don't need us, but you can come and we teach. We have the membership site broken down with all the modules. I, you know, parents, if, if you think about it, Joe, parents are the first manager for a lot of their kids. So there isn't a management school. You know, there isn't a place that says, hey, this is how you set up your website. This is why Twitter has to work this way. This is why Facebook has to work this way. This is how you get them to talk together. These are the things you should do for your kids. These are the things you shouldn't do for your kids. So we became that place. I noticed there was tons of stuff for the songwriters, tons of vocal lessons, tons of instrument lessons, but there wasn't a place where an artist could learn to be an artist. There wasn't a place where a young manager could come and learn how to manage or a young publicist could learn how to become a publicist. So I've kind of created this portal and I do tons of free teachings uh, all over the country and I'm, you know, I host a artist workshop and uh, music industry workshop here in Nashville first Tuesday of every month. We get 70 or 80 people and they're just eager to learn and it's been fun to teach. And that's two old hippies. It's at two old hippies. We we're about to outgrow it, I think. This last week we had close to seventy people, and it's a it's a great store, and they've got a great sound system and a great setup. But it's not really geared for more than twenty or thirty comfortably. And now we've got chairs sitting in the aisles, and I mean it's it was pretty fun. It was it was a good time. I'm uh, I'm in the process of putting one together with the uh, Nashville. Uh, convention uh, bureau where we're going to host at the uh, they have a visitor center in downtown Nashville right there on Lower Broadway at the Bridgestone Arena and once a month I'll host uh, an event for anyone who wants to come tourist anyone it's called so you want to be in the music business and I'll be there to answer questions and teach and share and just kind of give people a little bit of an insight on what they need to be on the lookout for while they're in town, places they can go and get their recordings done, inexpensive, you know, here's where you can go get your website done, inexpensive, here's where you can get photographs done that are quality but inexpensive. I call it my preferred vendors list. I've gone out and brought in these folks that are just amazing at what they do and instead of saying, hey, give me a kickback every time one of my people come, I say, give me the lowest possible price for my folks and I'll just keep referring business your way because it's it's more important that the savings get passed on for me to the artist you know if they see that I'm constantly providing for them and being of service to them then I'm usually the first person they'll come back and say hey where should I go next what should I do next so that's kind of what my goal has been and I stole an old real estate model and have been working with some of the best internet marketers in the world to figure out how to translate it over into the music business since we create more content than anyone in the world but we weren't doing well online and I had to figure out how so that's what I did I went out and I just learned and I continue to take courses and I'm members of a lot of different things and you know I've read more books this last year than I've read my whole life and I'm just constantly trying to find the things that are working online and in the digital world and bringing that into the music side because these kids don't have an opportunity to be signed to labels. There's just not enough room. There's a lot of talented people. So I have to figure out and I've tried to create a way where I can teach them how to build an audience, become a better partner, so then the labels come to them and say, okay, you've got something that's already moving. Let us now put our expertise to that and we can make magic happen. It is an exciting time in music nowadays. There's so much that is so good. It just seems to keep on mushrooming 
every year. It's just more and more. And I wonder if there is a point of oversaturation where people just don't have enough time in the day to concentrate on all this good music. I think there's going to become an oversaturation for people finding it, but there's never going to become an oversaturation of people wanting it. So what I do is I, I, I teach artists to fan engagement. As much as I love Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, that, as Seth Godin says, is not permission marketing. You know, I'm all about the list. I'm all about building a community of people, and I'm all about servicing that community of people. So what I teach the artists that I work with through the Blueprint is use the social media platforms that are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to drive people to a location where you give them something of value. Billboard Magazine just recently did a story on a concept I created called Seven Free Songs, where we were introducing artists to people with seven free songs. And a lot of times, you never get to hear a second song from an artist because the first single didn't have success. So we're building relationships with the music, and then every couple weeks, we're communicating with this group of people, but we're not just saying, hey, look at me, hey, vote for me, hey, buy for me, hey, do for me. We're giving. We're being a service. I'm teaching them how to treat them like they're friends. You know, whenever the phone rings, we can look at it and go, I don't want to take that call, or boy, if I get on that call, it's going to probably be 45 minutes, or uh-oh, he probably wants something or needs something. You know, we, we, we want to know our fans in that way, and the fans need to know us in that way where they go, man, every time Joe sends me an email, it's something of value, whether it's something you created or you read an article and you shared it with them, and it just shows that there's more than that one way. You know, it's the difference between being active and being engaged. Engaged means it's going both ways. So let's take us through a couple of steps. Say you're a beginning artist. Mm -hmm. You want to get things going in the right direction. How do you know that you're good enough? You know what? If you can put it out there and people other than your family like it. You know, a lot of people, it's funny, is they'll, they'll send it to me and they'll say, hey, I want you, I love this one. This is the best one for me is when a parent or someone sends me one song. It says, hey, would you listen to this and tell me if you think I have what it takes to be in this business? And I always go to him. I said, that's like me throwing one perfect pass and asking Aaron Rodgers, do I have what it takes to be a quarterback in the NFL? And then he starts asking me questions like, well, you probably need to lose about 100 pounds. You're 46 years old. This isn't going to happen. What's going on there? So that's what I tell people. There's more to this business than just the music. So that's the first thing. So what I want them doing is, one, just realizing if they play out for whoever you can and realize there's different levels of the music business. There's different levels of just being a performer. You may just want to be a street performer. You may want to just do coffee shops. You may just want to play in your room. You may just want to do whatever. But if you want to compete at the highest level, you have to tell us what makes you different not what makes you the same. So what we teach is branding. Who are you? Does your music coincide with what your message is, what it is that you're about? So just being pretty and able to sing, turn on the TV. There's thousands of those people. That doesn't make you different. So also, too, is you know everybody thinks you have to have a great voice. Bob Dylan didn't have a great voice, but Bob Dylan wrote music that changed people's lives. So that's what I tell people first is find out if there's an audience besides your family, Find out if people are connecting and relating to what it is that you're doing, and then figure out how to get it in front of as many people as possible online to see if there's really an audience for it. I remember talking to an artist in my region about their complaint of hiring reps to get played on the radio and how necessary it is to have a rep and pay all this money to have any radio anywhere know that the record was out there and get any kind of traction. I disagree. I completely disagree. It's a waste of money. You're basically, the way that radio works right now is that everything starts in overnights. They have very little room for the hundreds of artists. I mean, record companies right now, I do a nice little math feature uh, inside the blueprint. I said, let's say there's 10 labels and they can have 10 artists. That's 100 people at a time 
that are getting a shot at this business. Most labels can only effectively work four at a time. So that meant 60 that were good enough to make the team aren't even in the game. They're sitting on the bench waiting their turn. Now these people all have money behind them coming from the record label. So then little independent artist shows up and record labels take a look, or radio stations take a look at them and say, okay, anytime they invest in an artist, they're hoping that that artist is going to be around. They're hoping that the investment that they're making in this artist is going to be long lasting. So what happens is, is a lot of these radio promoters have relationships where, sure, they'll take 15 grand a month from you and take you out on radio tour that you also pay for and introduce you to radio people, but it doesn't guarantee or necessarily translate into airplay but you're still writing that check for $15,000. I would much rather tell someone, take that same $15,000, use it as tour support to start getting into these markets and start building a following in those markets and then make the radio station have to play you because you got 70, 80, 90 people that are hounding the radio station to play your, your artist, play whoever it is that you are. So anybody wants to go the radio route, I always tell them this, until you have an audience, don't spend money on a radio and don't spend money on expensive recordings because radio is going to look at your social sites. They're going to sit there and say, okay, so you're relying on us to make you famous. Don't think so. Next. You, buy a, you record a record and you don't have an audience. You're saying, hey, I need you to take what it is that I felt was good enough for you in the first place instead of bringing out acoustic songs and interacting with the audience. The greatest thing about Taylor and what people seem to forget is she didn't have Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. She didn't have a song at radio. She didn't have anything recorded except like her demos, which she wasn't allowed to give away. What she had to give away was herself. So she spent months finding out what made her audience laugh, what made them cry, sharing with them what made her laugh what made her cry. So when she wrote her record, she wrote it for the audience. And when she released her record, it went gold in 15 weeks because the audience was already there. She created a product for her audience. Most people don't do that. They go in the studio, record a record of a bunch of their favorite songs. Most of them have never been played out live. They, know, they don't realize if there's any interaction whatsoever with them. And then they throw it up on iTunes because they think it looks cool to have, hey, get my song on iTunes. And what people don't understand about that, Joe, as soon as they say they put out that it's available on iTunes, someone like me in the industry who wants to see how relevant you are can go check. I can go to SoundScan and say, wow, you've got 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and 80,000 Twitter followers, but only 100 people bought your record. I guess they're not really connecting with you. I guess they're not buying what you're selling. They're not buying it on your dime. Why am I going to put my dime in to see if they'll buy it then? Next. Next. So I always tell people, be careful how soon we find you. Make sure that you have everything in place. Make sure that, you know, record company, Scott Borchetta uh, and I were speaking on a panel one time, and this little girl raised her hand, and she goes, why is it so hard for me to get to you? Why is it where I can't get my music to you? And he says, you should be grateful that you can't get to me. He says, because when you get to me, you're telling me that you're ready to compete with Tim McGraw and Rascal Flatts and Taylor Swift and Carrie Underwood. And most of the time you're not. So that gives me an opportunity to check you right off the list and move on to the next one. He said, so be, be happy that those people are in place because they're going to get you to a position where once you do finally get to me, you're ready. And most people aren't, but they think it's, it's who, you know, right place, right time. And I beg to differ with that. I always say it's the right person at the right place at the right time because a lot of people have had that opportunity and squandered it away because they weren't prepared. And what the music industry blueprint does is prepares people for their opportunities, whatever that opportunity might be, because once they get in the door, it's out of my control. It's out of the artist's control at that point. It's now up to the person who's watching them, whether it connects with them and makes a deal. And if it doesn't connect with them, then you go to the next person. And if it doesn't connect with them, you go to the next person. But at least when you go in, you're able to sing, you're able to play, you're able to communicate. All your social stuff is in place. So when they're asking you questions, you're not freaked out. When they ask you about your audience, you've got answers for answers to those questions about your audience. That's where I felt I could be of more service in this industry was being a teacher 
was being able to uh, be a mentor, was able to be able to provide. I've had great mentors. I've, I'm like that three-year-old that, that runs around going, why, how come, why, how come? You know, Every chance I got to speak with somebody in this business, I asked questions, and when they talked, I listened, and I got as much knowledge from them that I can, and not all of it was relevant to today, but anybody who's been in this business for, for a long time, they have something to offer. You just may need to put today's twist on it, and that's the big thing. It's like, well, I ain't talking to – mistake. I'm talking to everybody. Anybody who will talk to me, I'll talk to them, and I'll, I always tell people, I've made a fortune plagiarizing lazy people. You know, I'm not the first guy to come up with a lot of things, but I'm usually the first guy to finish it. So that's what I encourage artists to do as well. Rick, I noticed your wristband. I am second. Can you yes. tell us about that? Yeah, basically, I'm second. Jesus is first. You know, I, uh, I'm, I've been sober over 21 years. I played as hard as I could possibly play in the 80s and tried to do everything I could to kill myself in the 80s with what I put in my body. And for whatever reason, God had other plans for me, and I, I basically realized that it's interesting. I, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan, and I people always compare me. They go, you're like the Dave Ramsey of the music business. You're always trying to tell people, don't spend money here. Don't do it here. If you can't afford this, don't do it. And, and Dave's kind of the same way. Some of the things that I've learned through listening to people like Dave Ramsey and Brenda Burchard and these guys is that if you find a way to serve as many people as you possibly can, you then will also be served and it's so true you know and everybody goes oh that sounds kinda cosmic and kinda whatever just think about it in your daily life if you go around helping people the rewards that come back to you and every it doesn't necessarily have to even mean financial rewards but people are usually nicer when they talk back to you and there's these those are rewards that people forget about just people being nice to you is a great reward to have especially in today's society when everybody's kinda freaking out we're in a business, Joe, where people, we can feed off their dreams real quick and real easy. And I can sit there and say, hey, I've worked with so-and-so and I've worked with so-and-so. One of the things that's interesting about me is that I will never use in my advertising who I've worked for. Google's a very powerful tool. We're on it right now. Let them go find out who I've worked for. And then we'll have that conversation because what I felt early on was if I go out saying, hey, I worked for Taylor Swift, come work for me. What they're actually hearing is, holy cow, this guy can make me the next Taylor Swift, which is not true. There will never be another Taylor Swift. Artists need to want to be the first them. If I tell them, hey, I consulted Sony and Big Machine Records, they're going to say, holy cow, this guy can take me into Sony and Big Machine Records. Well, not unless you're ready, you know, because my reputation's on the line at that point. So what I tell people is, Here's the people that I've worked with. Here's the experience and the knowledge I've been able to gain from that. This is what I can do for you. Because ultimately, that's all people really want to know anyway. It's like, all right, cool. Enough with the Taylor stories. What can you do for me? You know, she's already famous. What can you do for me? You know, and I always tell people if they're getting in this job to be famous, they're in the wrong place. You know, if, if you're looking to build a career, then I can teach you. If you're looking to be famous, I tell them, go do a sex tape, put it on YouTube, it'll go viral, and you might get a fragrance and a reality show out of the deal, you know? But this isn't the place if you're looking to be famous. It just is not. So. Well, Rick, I really appreciate your time. It's been a huge pleasure to have you on the show. Anytime, anytime. It's, it's always fun to, to talk about the business. As you can see, I'm never really short for words. So at least that's what my wife tells me anyway. <laughs> Check him out musicindustryblueprint.com Rick Barker on today's Lingua Musica where music is the universal language I'm your host Joe Kendrick until next time